The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, well, uh, it's been 20 years since I've been on this campus. And, and I mean, I, I see I would have been in your place, I mean, just 20 years back. And I know the, the problems that, that, that history teachers actually face when teaching history to undergrads, you know, like y'all. And uh, I thought uh, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd propose a lecture, a special lecture for y'all, just to kind of give a global perspective on things. Uh, Usually, you're taught history as uh, some people, some buildings, some places, and and uh, somehow the interconnections are just lost. And uh, uh, I can tell you how some of the maps would look. Is uh, to your left is uh, a map of Iran, and these are how national history is actually written. What is outside of the borders is a complete abyss. It's and uh, to your right is is what you would call like a, relig a religious history is like an expansion of of domains, uh, political domains, and uh, you have no idea of what is happening outside of this. Again, it's it's black. Um, we get some clues in in um, in a book by uh, Mark Kurlansky called Salt: a World History. It is a book, as the name suggests, completely about salt. From the preservation of mummies and the pickling of vegetables in ancient Egypt to Gandhi's salt march in Gujarat, as a demonstration against colonial taxes, it is only about salt. The anecdotes are fun to read, and it successfully makes connections across cultures just by telling stories about salt. Uh, the world seems a much smaller space. Uh, People seem more alike. Uh, their physiological and transcendental connections with salt are no longer local, but enmeshed in the economic, scientific, political, religious, and culinary occupations of the world. In short, uh, it's making connections through anecdotes, maybe, but it's making connections. Um, to the right is a global history of architecture by Ching, Jazombek, and Prakash. Uh, which also focuses on, on seeing connections, tensions, and associations in a similar way. Uh, they, they call it synchrony. So when things actually happen simultaneously around the world, uh, it's not just a matter of coincidence. It's part of uh, a larger scheme of architectural development. Um, and uh, that, that somehow uh, hints towards a much uh, a better way of looking at history uh, beyond the stigmatizing uh, uh, discourses on, 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 na on nations and things like that. Um, so yeah, you'll be wondering, I mean, I'm going to spend 40 minutes talking about bricks. And uh, well, I'll just like to justify that. Uh, the, the brick is a global thing. Uh, it's surely the most common building material in the world. And since almost every geographical region in the world has adopted it during some phase in history, uh, it promises to make a great global history. Uh, so just like salt, it, it has a kind of a universal use. And uh, I will talk about bricks. And if other things come up, we can talk about those. So uh, obviously, I'm not the first. Uh, Brick of World History by James W. P. Campbell uh, provides great insights into the use of brick in all its forms. Mud bricks, baked bricks, glazed bricks, terracotta, shaped bricks, as well as bricklaying techniques and brick production throughout history. Of course, uh, he's an Englishman, and he, he kind of climaxes on the Renaissance. So uh, in some way, I'd like to uh, extend his study to to kind of incorporate things that happen maybe in in China. Uh, well, 
I kind of needed some authority on my introduction, and uh, who better than Lutchins? Uh, he's well known for uh, uh, building amazing brick houses in 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 England, and he also happened to build the De the Imperial Capital complex in Delhi. Uh, a short walk around Mass Ave would, uh, would kind of start you off on this journey. And uh, I think uh, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to point out the details right now, but if you can just start keeping some details in mind, you'll, you'll start making connections through the lecture. So uh, this is the Ashdown House, and this is the lobby. Um, uh, I remember 20 years back, I used to uh, practice my mountain climbing on this wall. And uh, these are basically these deformed bricks that are kind of embedded into this wall. And uh, uh, of course, the inside too are, is extremely beautiful. Uh, this is by Eero Saranen. Uh, so you can start seeing patterns. And of course, this requires, this is called the herringbone pattern. And this requires a lot of skill. Obviously, this one has kind of caved in in some way. Um, uh, this is Hi-Fi Pizza. You wouldn't have noticed the building above, but it's, it's quite remarkable. It's got some pretty beautiful details there. And, uh, Keep these in mind for sure. Um, so this is this is terracotta. Uh, I'm I'm wondering uh, if if you can start writing back. I mean, writing a history for this. I mean, how how did things get here? Uh, some kind of a, a movement of technology, and I think that's what that's what I'm more interested in 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 kind of sharing this kind of a global history with you. So, uh, so what, I'll, what I'll start with is the first brick. Uh, these were essentially hand molded and uh, they were just mud and water and uh, they kind of resemble these uh, pieces of dough. And uh, the, the ones at the, at the bottom uh, actually have some finger impressions uh, marked in it. Um, why why do you make bricks? Why not just uh, construct in mud? Uh, there's there are some reasons. Uh, the first reason and probably the most important one would be transport. Is that it's tougher to transport mud than transport brick. Uh, in uh, as far as uh, you need some kind of formwork to actually fill mud in and then compact it. Brick, of course, comes kind of made, if especially like this. Uh, the first bricks were actually found in Neolithic Jericho, 8,300 BC. So this is old. Uh, I moved to the River Valley civilizations and uh, their use of, of brick. I, I would define brick in its widest sense, incorporating pottery and terracotta and I mean taking in as much as things that are made of mud and then baked or uh, sun dried or or just molded in hand uh, these yellow patches are uh, I, I don't they didn't settle here to make bricks I want to make that very clear so the river valley had other things to offer it wasn't the bricks. And of course, uh, the Banpo is, uh, I'm sure, kind of surprising. It normally doesn't f uh, come under the, the, the genesis of brick. And uh, this was interesting. And uh, it, it, it had one of the most advanced kilns at, for the time. And uh, I'd, I'd like you all to keep that in mind for the rest of the lecture, because somehow, uh, China keeps producing uh, very interesting baked products 
uh, well fired uh, throughout history, uh, and it kind of stays a little aloof from from this kind of a mass that will keep growing throughout the lecture. Um, 1500 BC, uh, uh, the the image on top is is a, a wall painting, and uh, it shows the process of the brick making, and uh, they obviously used, uh, they kind of evolved into using molds for uh, for their uh, for the bricks, and uh, these were sun dried, so they had mud, water, and grass, and they kind of mix them up and uh, and and uh, set them in in what you see as as the mold. Um, This is, uh, so why don't I just locate this? This would be the Mesopotamian angle. So uh, they had, they developed four different kinds of bricks at, in this time. And uh, they were, th this is a ziggurat. So they were basically mounds of, of bricks. But they also managed to develop molded bricks. Now, these these would actually be uh, uh, constructed on on a large scale. They'd be uh, set up uh, on 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 the floor. They actually designed as as a complete as a complete uh, panel, and then fired separately. So it, it is quite an elaborate uh, method. Um, this is again another settlement between Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, there can also be patterns made in uh, in mud bricks, and uh, this one, of course, is uh, is something related to the palm tree. They probably uh, had some kind of an uh, icon iconic kind of connection there, um, and it has a very uh, a stark elevation. This is the great temple of Rima. And we come to the Indaswari civilization. Uh, this is a, a pic of, of Mohin Jadaro. Uh, what, what actually remains in, in these ruins are uh, actually baked bricks and just heaps of, of mud bricks. Uh, what, what you find is bathrooms. Uh, uh, gutters, public baths, uh, graves, uh, things that uh, that uh, that you'd build in in baked brick. So there's a certain importance assigned to baked brick in this time, uh, which is uh, which kind of tells on 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 how much effort was actually involved in making the bricks. So uh, there was at at some point in in 3000 BC. It, it, baked brick was was thirty times more expensive than mud brick. So, and uh, there have also been studies involving uh, uh, the Indus, where uh, they actually said that fired brick was a product of urban specialists. So this was already uh, some kind of a, an industry building up here, and uh, it it kind of required certain political economies that. That uh, that can that produce these bricks. Um, when we come to thousand BC, uh, there's a kind of a surge in Mesopotamia, and uh, the Aryan uh, kind of descent into the Ganges Valley. Uh, again, this is still restricted to the river valleys, and uh, though not too much remains of uh, of uh, the Ganges, uh, of the of the Aryan uh, temples built uh, at, in this period. Um, I I just wanted to briefly indicate uh, uh, the Greek Empire and uh, its contribution to this study is uh, basically the the roof tiles, and uh, uh, apart from that. Uh, it doesn't 
really expand this this these yellow patches basically for for the study so uh, in a way uh, studies that are that are uh, focused uh, primarily on on some kind of material aspects uh, kind of overlook uh, certain other histories and uh, um, yeah so some some civilizations just don't don't appeal in the brickness. Um, this is Babylon, uh, the first science of, of glazed brick, of course, used very extensively. This is also uh, uh, laid out on uh, as a panel and then uh, glazed and then baked separately. Uh, now. Uh, in this period, there's a little, um, this is 400 BC, and this would be when Buddhism just gave a little push to, to brickwork in East India. And, uh, and of course, uh, China in this time. Uh, Okay, so uh, we move into uh, 200 BC, which was, uh, which is uh, the 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 expansion of the Roman Empire, and uh, in China we see the dynasty actually starting to break uh, to build the 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 Great Wall of China, and uh, so this is this is Rome. Uh, technology is taken to to a whole other limit, uh, the the use of of uh, the concreted wall, uh, and uh, here in Rome, uh, the, the the industry actually builds up to the point that it can it can mass manufacture for an empire this large. I mean, it's expanding right north of of the entire Africa and. You have most of Europe taken in, and uh, of course, it gets all the way to England. And we see the transference of of certain Greek details into into terracotta, into brick, into kind of cut brick. And this is an an interesting interesting point where you can actually see certain technologies being invented to to suit a transition in some way. And uh, here again, uh, I'd just like to bring to your notice that uh, the cornice actually, as in, in Greek architecture, the cornice is again extremely important for, for the brickwork in Rome as well. And uh, the, the use of, of corbelling uh, is, uh, is, is, is used. Uh, this, is a, this is an example of a brick kiln in in Rome, they say that there were uh, even coal coal kilns. I mean that would kind of uh, uh, justify their their rapid expansion and their produ production of of uh, brick at such in such uh, large scales. Uh, their their standard types were uh, the one right at the bottom is uh, was actually two feet by two feet, and that was their standard tile that they use. This was the, the Roman brick. And the ones above are actually special bricks used for other reasons. Uh, this, is, this is the Great Wall of China, actually. Um, this is... Uh, this is a time. The black outline in this in this map actually indicates uh, how far the Buddhist empire actually did go uh, at this time. And uh, but it again does not really affect uh, the the brick history as yet. So China still remains uh, a little uh, kind of uh, producing uh, terracotta soldiers, the, the terracotta army, and and. Uh, this kind of a whole different uh, uh, brickwork, while uh, the Sasanians actually take on this 
uh, a whole new a new style for brickwork. Um, this is an example of a fire temple, and this is just the extents of of the Sasanian Empire. Um, there's a there's a flamboyance in in structural uh, use of brick, and uh, of course, as as ornament as to its uh, it's it's used extensively. Uh, these are the terracotta warriors in 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 China, and uh, I mean these are these are thousands and thousands of them. So uh, this is actually it, it's like a they're actually working on kind of a parallel technology in some way. Um, this uh, 600 uh, CE is when we actually uh, um, we start seeing the the. The, the fragmentation of of the Roman Empire, and it's it's two arms: one the Byzantine, and the other the Ravenna. And uh, there's also then a, a, a surge in in Bengal at this time. Uh, I I put this map here just to kind of uh, clarify certain things. Is that what actually is missing in this one? Uh, and uh, so I actually placed this in, in just to kind of give you all a reference in some way of, of where all the empires actually had extended in some way. And uh, you see the Europe is completely fragmented there. And, and of course, the, the Umayyads is, have, have taken over the, the entire, I mean, the, the first expansion of Islam. And... Uh, And we see a, a, the the complete difference uh, between between the two styles actually. In uh, in to the left is actually the Byzantine, and to the right is is the Ravenna style. And uh, there's a certain solidity that is that is associated with the Ravenna style, which actually continues through uh, in Italy. And uh, while while uh, the use of of more flamboyant, more slender arches actually are uh, are actually used in the in the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, and uh, we see the, the the first the emergence of the dog tooth pattern here. Uh, you can see it in the top left photograph, and you can see the towards the roof. It's actually lined with the dog tooth. Uh, pattern, and uh, that would be the one on the left here, uh, left bottom. And uh, to as a, as a comparison, just between the left and the right, you can actually see the 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 kind of differences between the two styles. One much more solid, and uh, the one on the left actually more 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 flamboyant in that way. Uh, there's also a a kind of creation of, of terracotta as, as a facade material. This uh, is actually the, the little splurge of when Buddhism and Hinduism actually found some kind of a confluence in, in, uh, in eastern central India. And uh, these, are the f these are the few uh, surviving brick temples uh, in the region. And uh, these are, of course, they, they are they are completely cut brick, and uh, when when we come to uh, 900 CE, uh, the the Abbasids have kind of uh, have already lost their their empire, uh, which is. Uh, which was actually which extended all of that green, and uh, and the Samanids actually are 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 a group close to the Caspian, which which are actually developing this uh, very uh, very uh, intense uh, technology on on decorative brickwork, and uh, we see this uh, the Ganges Valley again dotted with these brick temples at this time. Uh, 
Um, this is actually just a, an enamel kind of a, a on uh, an enamel decoration on a chest, which actually shows some kind of a confluence between uh, uh, the 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 Roman and the and the Islamic. So actually, what what uh, what I want to want to talk about is is the is the smooth transition between from the Roman to the Islamic, and uh, this whole. Uh, uh, and and we'll see it how it's actually played out in in these different buildings around uh, around the Islamic Empire. So these are actually the early the early mosques built by the Abbasids, and uh, and we see as as it uh, we see it in uh, in Sevilla where uh, a certain adaptation of of those of the slightly more flamboyant style is actually is actually made out, and uh, you see it in in Caravan as well. Uh, the the dome is actually created by by eight arches, so uh, that in a in a kind of a Roman um, method. Uh, this is I think the, uh, one of the most blatant examples of of the transfer. Of, of the most smooth transfer from the Roman to to the Islamic, and this would be uh, this is in Toledo in Spain, and uh, we see the arches which are again uh, they're, they're dumb arches in some way, and uh, it's it's uh, it's something that will keep repeating in uh, in uh, in Islamic architecture of this time, especially that which overlaps with the Roman Empire, so. Uh, in some way, there's there's this whole uh, kind of no apprehension to uh, to adapting to uh, appropriating. The, the transition just seems to be extremely smooth in that way. And this, of course, is is the tomb of the Samanids. It's a beautiful building. Uh, this was this is the, the the area near the Caspian, actually, which I was talking about, which actually develops its own. Its own way of of decorative masonry, in in this building, uh, the the bricks are not really special bricks. They are they are your they are almost the same cuboidal bricks that you get today. Uh, it is it is purely in the brick laying that uh, that you find the decorative brick, uh, brick masonry as a as a craft. Um, and of course, there are uh, there are the same kind of signs uh, for for some kind of a development from Sasanian and Roman. So there's there's a kind of combination here in this region. These are some of the bonds which which are actually uh, which are just beautiful. I mean, there's just this. And and then of course they that that entire area develops its style from from here. This is uh, this is a minaret built in almost the same kind of a, a, a pattern and and technology also. So you see the same uh, the fourth band from the bottom actually has those circles, and uh, you can you can find those those similar circle, circular special breaks in. In this mosque, as, uh, in this tomb as well, at the, at the top. Uh, and this was the the little flourish between uh, in in central and eastern India. This is Nalanda University. Uh, again, made of brick, and uh, there are, at, at this time there's a proliferation of of Stupas that actually go out, uh, made of brick. Um, at, this is uh, this is now getting to where I would be more interested in the study, is uh, the the emergence of Pagan in in Burma, and uh, and some kind of a parallel uh, similar. Decorative masonry in in 
by the Seljuk uh, Turks. And uh, this is an, an interesting time because uh, the central region between them is actually occupied by, uh, by other political uh, by other political parties, and uh, it, this this actually I mean th this would be a little hypothetical, but it is it is worth proposing in the sense of uh, when we actually see uh, uh, we see the, uh, some kind of a, a terracotta uh, facing, which is uh, which is uh, adapted in some way to uh, uh, to the Islamic motif and things like that. And, and this is, of course, pro proliferated uh, through the use of, of certain forms. Uh, Robert Hillenbrand, uh, an Islamic uh, scholar, actually uh, uh, theorizes this in the sense that he, uh, he talks about it in the sense of that a, a certain amount of mosques were already built in, this, in these regions. And the idea of, of, of uh, spreading identity in some way, religious identity, was actually uh, adop adopted by these other buildings, which were the minaret and uh, the tomb. And uh, these are tombs that are actually pro proliferate from, uh, from Iran uh, during the Seljuk Turks, uh, Turks and uh, they reach all the way till Aswan, Egypt. And of course, this these tombs are uh, they 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 carry the same uh, kind of patterns that that were persistent in in the Caspian area. Uh, this is Isfahan. This is the great mosque at Isfahan, and uh, this uh, the entire linear route um, that 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 leads to the to the main mosque is is the Market Street, and uh, each of each of the domes is actually built in in a different pattern, so you have a, a complete and and I'm, I'm just showing an example at the right hand bottom here uh, of of how these patterns actually uh, were used in in this dome construction, you by vaulting of course. This is in Ardistan. This again the Seljuk Turks. In in England. Uh, in, this is a little later. Sorry. Uh, in uh, in Burma, uh, I was talking about the the Pagan Empire, and and this actually stretched the entire height of 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 uh, Burma, and this was along the river Irrawaddy, and uh, this the. the 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 empire is is about four hundred years old, but it, it sees us some kind of a prolif proliferation of of decorative brickwork at this time, and uh, it's interesting to to kind of see uh, the references of this empire of Pagan with respect to the Seljuk Turks as well as China, in the sense that it actually adopts uh, uh, the terracotta kind of a the terracotta wares that are that are that make some kind of reference to both to both regions and uh, this is of course a time when when uh, the, the entire area is global and uh, the whole uh, and and these these connections are very possible of of this kind of a transfer of of technology uh, 1200 uh, we see uh, the lower uh, kind of the 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 African route actually connecting back to to the Nile and and uh, uh, Italy producing uh, maintaining its production of of decorative brickwork and and England as well. Um, so uh, we see the first the first uh, building built out of Roman bricks. And uh, this one is again. This is uh, this is a kind of a just a continuation of some kind of a tradition, uh, a kind of a technology of of construction. So this is this is Italy. 
so Siena. Um, the, the, the idea of, of the guild is actually building up at this time when uh, uh, certain groups of, of masons were actually getting together and, and producing and making buildings completely. So. This is uh, in, in Multan, close to Pakistan, now in Pakistan. This is all, uh, again, the same Iranian uh, technologies extended. Um, I kind of end at, at uh, at the, at the 1450 when, when I think uh, tracking brick uh, loses, I, I mean, I lost complete control of, of tracking brick at this time. It's when all medieval cities were being built and, and every medieval city was built out of brick. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, I, I kind of, uh, with the black outline, I just uh, give a rough impression of where where uh, these these cities actually were being built in some way. Uh, we see fortification, and uh, of course these are now details that you can start seeing here as well in in the real estate building and things like that. So this is where actually certain medieval fort-like constructions were uh, propagated, some kind of a decorated brick masonry. This is uh, in England. These are uh, these are again special bricks. They are uh, the, uh, the the complete design is 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 seen first, and then uh, and then the the bricks are actually molded and then uh, placed to to form this this kind of a pattern. Uh, around the 1600s, we also see. Uh, a, a propagation of of this of of the pigeon tower or the dove court uh, as carrying decorative brick masonry on it, and uh, this this goes all the way to England, north north of France, Germany. Completely, uh, it fills up all of Iran. Uh, so so this kind of a form, which is actually carrying uh, a very secular form, carrying uh, the the pattern brick masonry. Uh, I, I, I keep this one in the sense that uh, I'd like to talk about pattern brick masonry as some kind of a branding, uh, in the sense of, of branding of empire, if that's possible, in the sense that uh, a complete set of public institutions are actually built in, in pattern brick masonry. So how you can actually recognize uh, an architect's work, uh, uh, maybe in the city you can actually point out to a Gary building or something like that. In, in that sense, this actually has a kind of a sense of branding in, that, in, in the way that it's extremely recognizable. Um, I, I see four regions actually in the 1600s as, as developing their, their characteristic decorative brick masonry. Uh, one is Bengal, the other is Italy, England and Iran. So these are kind of four pockets which are actually extremely connected through the buildings that I've just shown you. Uh, and and I'd, I'd like to take, take one thread through and, I'd, and that would be Bengal. Uh, these are pre-Mughal empire, this is the pre-Mughal uh, Sultanate in Bengal uh, of God and Hazrat Pandwa. And uh, you can see these are of course completely ruined. Uh, this is you can just see the the few patterns and the terracotta works uh, in 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 this picture. Uh, the mosques. Uh, this is uh, the Eklaki mausoleum. Again, it's it's the proliferation of the tomb as the as the carrier of and and these images are actually reminiscent of the Aswan tombs and and uh, it's it's and the pagan and and this this kind of a the plan is is a, a chamber and it's a very solid structure, uh, decorated brick, uh, brickwork and 
uh, this is a very uh, high level of terracotta facing in, in these works. And, and these mosques, uh, well, there are two stories for these mosques. One is that uh, uh, they, they actually plundered the Pagan temples and the Buddhist temples in the area and actually used the terracotta for the mosques. Uh, or, of course, it, it, a more global explanation would be that the, the craftsmen were just there. And uh, this kind of a, uh, just a blurring of boundaries and the movement of craftsmen can actually facilitate architecture like this. And this moves very smoothly into, these are, these are temples, these are Hindu temples. And uh, in Vishnupur, again, Bengal. And again, they have the same uh, kind of a tomb-like uh, character to them. And uh, uh, you can see the whole, the, the transference of from Buddhist to Islamic and to Hindu and uh, kind of a re religious integration. And uh, we end up with a 19th century uh, settlement in Bengal, which is again built in brick. This is just one settlement and, and then the, uh, there are, uh, there are accounts of the river changing course, and this is actually the entire delta region of the Ganges. So the the, the river keeps changing course in that sense. Uh, the importance of cities also kind of depends on that. Uh, later in the 19th century, decorative brick masonry actually gets into uh, international expositions as representative of some kind of identity. Uh, it it uh, it 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 is uh, put into manuals into mm. these are some of the first houses built. Not on the left is actually the one of the first houses built in in America, and uh, this would be of course the the New England kind of a house. And uh, these these the one on the right is uh, in uh, D.C. Um, these are again carry forward of, of some kind of pattern brick masonry which is which which finds a complex route through uh, through England and uh, uh, more more recent uh, we have Antonio Gaudi who uh, kind of worked with all kinds of decorative brickwork in the sense of special bricks and uh, terracotta, uh, uh, deformed bricks, tiles, uh, in that sense. Uh, even more recent, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, and Louis Kahn. And we also have the Monad Nock building in Chicago. And uh, certain uh, sensibility about about making the plinth carries forward uh, through through uh, through certain examples which I do not show you all. Uh, is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright kind of emphasizes uh, the horizontal in some way, and you can see his his vertical joints are are flush with the brick, and uh, his his horizontal are actually recessed. In some way, so you actually catch horizontal lines as shadows. Uh, these were also used in in Roman brickwork uh, long before. Uh, Iran, of course, uh, this is recent work, an Aga Khan winner, Aga Khan award winner, and uh, it actually uh, kind of uses decorative brick masonry as as an identity. Uh, as a national identity now. It, it reflects in miniatures, it reflects in, in the architecture as well. Um, I'll, I'll just end with the works of Laurie Baker in Kerala, India. And uh, his, his, he, he being called the poor man's architect. So the, the actually brickwork uh, starts uh, in, in, in the developing nations, uh, starts to kind of respond to um, uh, 
the financial conditions and and basically the general economy of of the, the and of course making beautiful buildings within a certain economy um he uses the the thinnest wall possible which is just a uh, half of the brick size and of course the stability is got through certain geometries of of arch, of arches and plan and things like that this is a girls hostel this and i'll just end on on some on a note on which is slightly more technology based in the sense that we've we've kind of passed the the stage of of uh, of doing this and uh, and our kilns have definitely kind of evolved into uh, um into this at the right hand bottom is actually what our modern brick making factory would look like and and the possibilities of of creating any kind of brick of any color and any size and any uh any consistency um uh, and just the fact that uh the potential of decorative brick masonry even today thank you